So welcome everyone. I'm Giacomo Scandolara, uh, co-founder and managing director at Giga Design <coughs> Studio. I'm glad to thank, first of all, the Uzbekistan Pavilion for the hospitality, especially uh, the Uzbekistan Art and Culture Development Foundation, Gayane Umarova and Madina Badlova, that gave us the opportunity to organize this conversation around uh, uh, art on Web uh, 3.0. The theme of the talk is something uh, we are very interested about since we are experiencing ourselves this kind of issues uh, while developing a bottom-up uh, anti-metaverse called superinternet.world. And now I will uh, turn the floor over to Silvia Del Dosso, who will continue to moderate the event. And Silvia has long uh, been involved in the study of new technologies often related uh, to web and art. She is co-founder of Cluster Duck Collective, and together with uh, me and other four founding uh, members, uh, she is working on developing the super internet world. And so I give you. <laughs> Thank you, you Taco. And a special thanks to all our guests, of course. Okay. So um, the theme of the discussion is going to be. Is it possible to experience and, and design a bottom-up uh, alternative of Web3? Uh, this is something that many of us uh, were asking themselves since Matthew Ball, uh, a theorist of the metaverse, actually was uh, affirming the opposite. We don't have the tools. Maybe, um, I mean, um, ma mainly, um, just a few companies in Silicon Valley has the tools to influence this world. So we actually don't know at this point if we are going towards something that could resemble to Web 1.0 or if we are just contributing and creating something that is even more uh, uh, hyper capitalized and dystopic than the Web uh, 2.0. So uh, I'm going to present our guest. This is the strange moment in which I'm talking about you and you are in the room. <laughs> OK, so um, Andrea Baronchelli, uh, he's the economic data science team lead at the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, he also founded and ran the Talking Economy Group. Uh, he came here despite the ice strike, and he was a hero. For that, he's coming from uh, Palma de Mallorca, <laughs> uh, where he had another conference. But anyway, he's here because uh, last year, if I'm not mistaken, uh, he wrote together with Mauro Martino and uh, some other colleagues a uh, viral uh, paper, scientific paper, which was called Mapping the NFT Revolution. And uh, in a moment in which many of us actually didn't understand what was going on, they were able to gather uh, a very big data set of NFT sales and buys and uh, to discover something that he's going to tell us. Then, um, Domenico Quaranta. Domenico Quaranta is an art critic, curator, and educator with the focus on art in the international milieu. Uh, for those who follow net art and media art, um, actually, I'm, I'm struggling not to say digital art because I know that you hate the word. Uh, he's a kind of uh, guru. Um, he also um, is connected a lot with artists that were operating uh, already when the uh, web 1.0 was active, and this is kind of interest for, interesting for us, but he's also here because uh, he lately, last year, wrote a book which is called Sa Surfing with Satoshi, and also organized an online exhibition which is called The Byzantine Journal Problem, which is about uh, crypto, and he's going to talk later about that. <laughs> and then Maria Fala Fernandez, she's the co-founder co of NF NFT Decentralized Platform, which is called jpeg.space. She's also founder at the Department of Des Decentralization. And um, OK, Maria came from uh, in Berlin from Argentina in 2013, and this was actually a big time in Berlin for the crypto open source, uh, source 
seen, and uh, she's going to also maybe talk about her project with Ito Style, which is called Struck Dao. And then, last but not least, we have Ryder Reeves. He's reaching from remote. He's in Los Angeles. He woke up at 5 to be with us. And um, OK, uh, he has legs. So do you feel comfortable <laughs> in here? OK. Um, so uh, Ryder, um, he's a conceptual artist, programmer, and creative director. But uh, for the us who uh, were following, uh, the, let's say, the, the web some years ago, he's also a kind of legend because he created a, a meme which is called Tag Life. And uh, he, with uh, OK Focus, uh, he worked with uh, musicians like Kanye West, James Blake, but also brands like Gucci, Marvel, etc. And um, he's going to talk about RRBAYC, uh, which is his last project, um, where he actually was able to unmask the Nazi and alt-right symbologies behind Bored Ape Yacht Club, which is a very sold um, uh, NFT collections that you maybe knew. And he also created the Million Dollar Homepage, which is another very interesting collaborative NFT project. So um, now we are going to start uh, uh, with Andrea. So we are going to go in an order which may be the most simple to understand to the most <laughs> and not easy to understand. So, uh, Andrea, you discovered uh, something during uh, your work at, uh, with mapping the NFT revolution that could maybe be useful for us to continue our conversation. So I'm going to pass the mic to you. And Thank you, Silvia, and thank you for being here and for the invitation. So this is a video we made to accompany our paper. Uh, I'm a physicist by background, and I study complex social systems. So in general, I'm very interested in how this intermediating technology affects our behavior. We have seen what happened with social network that this intermediates information production and consumption. That's a branch. Uh, the blockchain uh, attracted my attention not too much early on, but a few years ago as a technology that disintermediates the creation of and, and consumption of value, of course. So uh, we were already studying cryptos when in 2017 CryptoKitties came out. I don't know if you're familiar with CryptoKitties. CryptoKitties are these kitties, actually, as a sort of game on the blockchain. What's interesting is that at the time, this first example, popular example, of non-fungible token was uh, made was referred to in the press as the clear, visible proof that the crypto world was a, a world populated by mad people. So they, they, you, you can, can you imagine they are like, these crypto kitties are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, they even broke the Ethereum blockchain, what's this all about? Actually, a few months later, there was a, a crypto winter in 2018, things went slowly, and then NFTs uh, went out of the radar. The gaming industry was, was dealing with it, but it was in 2021, as we all know by now, when they came back strongly also in the press as a tool that offered many desirable features to the creators uh, of uh, on I don't want to use the word digital art, but I'm a physicist, so I can. <laughs> I can. And so we, we set out with my team and some collaborators to uh, harvest how, all the data we could harvest, and we got like four, four million NFTs uh, from a couple of blockchains. And we started to map, as the paper suggests, what was happening. And what was happening was very interesting because, as you can imagine, the, the, the vulgata, that there is a new technology that allows to uh, break the walls of galleries and allows everyone to, to reach immediately the buyers and therefore 
there are no gateways anymore, was true for a few weeks, perhaps. And then there was the usual problem of the economy of attention, that is, a, a, an explosion in offer, in the offering, created a problem at the level of uh, demand. So if you now today put something on OpenSea, if you're familiar with it, OpenSea is a large market with millions of uh, things offered, the chances that you get noticed are basically zero. If you don't accompany your activity with a massive and very clever by now uh, marketing enterprise. We went a little bit deeper than that, and we mapped at, uh, the network of buyers and vendors. So this is, these are actual data. This is not a graphical image. Each dot here is a, is a trader, and a link indicates a transaction that has happened between the two layers. The video is made by Mauro Martino, a colleague. And what we found is uh, that the market was very early on, so these are data until April 21, very concentrated. 85% of the traders, uh, sorry, the top 10% of the traders made 85% of the trades and trade at least once each, 97% uh, of the NFTs. So this idea, it's all horizontal, as usual it is not, and uh, we are very good as a species in creating these in unequal situations of wealth accumulation and even gatekeeping. Even without the collections, and this is a second paper that came later on, uh, if you take something like Bored Apes or CryptoPunks, you have a concept of rarity that distinguishes them, and it's actually only the most rare. So if you're familiar with CryptoPunks, uh, there are traits like a beard, uh, glasses, skin color, etc that are more rare than others. An NFT having rare traits is a, a rare NFT. And those rare NFTs gather most of the market attention. So this is interesting because from the point of view of the market, most of the pieces in a collection are actually fungible. If you really want to invest and make money, you should go for the top 10%. In any case, so we have this problem nowadays, and I know here the, the next contributions will, will go into this in much more detail, but there is this problem of curating that it has, that is, has broken completely the idea of horizontal market, as it's always the case, even in social network, we, you can produce your tweets, but of course, like, there are few influencers. And now we are in an NFT winter, and I conclude with this, so you have read everywhere that is, uh, we are, the transaction in September were 95% less than previously. This is true for Ethereum, probably the situation is a little bit better, but this has happened for cryptocurrencies many times, these winters followed by new bumps. Of course, for NFTs, the, the thing is interesting because we don't know what happens when a crisis uh, affects something that is non-fungible. Will some collection die and some other become more important or, or not? What is sure is that NFTs are very flexible tools and they are maturing in other sectors. For example, in the gaming industry, uh, they are real. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the fact that you can become the owner of an object in a digital world is a proto-metaverse under many respects, uh, which is creating, as usual, beneficial outcomes. If you're a teenager who plays a little bit and then wants to sell the sword you got by slaying a monster, this is nice. On the other end, if you are someone working 20 hours per day to gain points in a, in a video game, and this is not even going to you the profit, this is a, a exploitation and a problem. But the pressure these objects are introducing there in terms, for example, of portability are unprecedented for the industry. And I think that it's very interesting what's happening. Just to conclude, if you are the owner of a sword and you have paid it thousands of euros, you then want the sword not to die with the platform. So you would want a larger portability. And this is a pressure that that industry had never had before. Uh, so yeah, we, we did, again, this is the video, and we go for this quantitative mapping of what's going on under the surface. And 
I hope I wasn't too Thank long. Thank you. No, no, uh, you were perfect. Actually, <laughs> I remember when I was interviewing you and Mauro Martino, your colleague, one year ago, uh, you already observed that uh, you didn't have many secondary sales on the data, and that was kind of uh, interesting because at the time the NFT craze was booming, but already in that time the secondary sale data was very low. The secondary sale data, that's a super interesting and, and, and a point I should have mentioned before probably. So the secondary sale, of course the NFT one powerful tool and that everyone says is the artist will get a fee of profits from any secondary sale forever, which is true. The problem is secondary sales are not much. In April uh, 21, when we finished the first paper, the only 20% of the pieces ever sold had a secondary sale, and this number has consistently gone down in time. Now, there is, there is a, a twist to this. Some, for example, the rare NFTs in every collection are sold less frequently and, sold and give you a higher return on, on investment. So for a few NFTs, this could be a sign actually of, of worth, but for the majority of them, it's not a good sign for sure. Yeah, okay, we can come back to that later because I would have some other questions. But, sure, sure, sure. Uh, I'm gonna pass now the, the floor to Domenico Quaranta. Before, I just want to read a very short list of uh, questions that he made introducing his exhibition, The Byzantine General Problem, because they can be helpful, I think. So, um, Domenico was asking himself what is Web3 about? Um, an alternative to capitalism or ca capitalism at his worst? An em emancipatory network economy where everyone has a stake or a dystopian panopticon where only the best man wins? An opportunity to de for democracy or a techno-libertarian web, web dream? And, okay, I, I will gonna stop here, but uh, I would like to ask you, Domenico, um, why disagreeing in this um, ambient is so important, especially connected to the art world? Okay, thank you, Silvia, for the question. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, I, I will come to your uh, uh, questions, uh, maybe in, in the end of my uh, intervention. Uh, but, uh, of course, I, I wanted uh, first, uh, uh, as I've been described uh, as an enemy of uh, the digital art uh, label, to explain why I don't like uh, this, uh, uh, this label. Um, and then uh, I will probably come to uh, this uh, criticism about blockchain and crypto uh, markets through uh, some uh, that they consider uh, positive examples. Uh, I don't like digital art because uh, uh, I think it's one uh, of those uh, uh, labels that uh, um, uh, create uh, an artificial groupings of things uh, that uh, don't have uh, actually anything uh, in common with, uh, with each other. And also because it's, it creates an artificial separation between uh, what's digital and what's, uh, for example, in this uh, room. No? So between uh, uh, contemporary art and what's considered digital immaterial and so on. It's also uh, ineffective at this point in uh, time and uh, history because uh, uh, most uh, uh, of the things that uh, uh, people start doing uh, digitally uh, also turns uh, out to be uh, physical uh, installation uh, translated uh, uh, in some more uh, familiar uh, media. Uh, and so this is uh, uh, why I don't like this question, this uh, uh, label. But I think it's interesting uh, um, that uh, we are speaking again uh, about digital art because uh, I think it was uh, one of those uh, labels that until uh, uh, 2000 uh, was out of the game. Uh, I mean, people were talking about post-media art, uh, new media art, and so on. 
Um, and uh, uh, it's exactly the economy around uh, uh, NFTs uh, that brought uh, this uh, uh, label again to, uh, to, to prominence. To describe what's actually the uh, production uh, of a community, however, uh, diverse uh, of uh, uh, people that uh, creatively engage with uh, digital uh, tools uh, and want to generate uh, um, um, a digital only market around uh, around it coming to the positive uh, example just uh, this is a screenshot from a zoom call uh, from yesterday uh, night uh, it was the birthday of uh, Kesiris, uh, the man uh, on the top uh, uh, window. Uh, some of you may uh, know, uh, maybe not Kesi, but uh, the program uh, he co-created, uh, which is called the Processing, and it's used uh, by, by uh, whoever mm, creatively engaged with the digital medium to design uh, uh, installations, uh, to do sketches, uh, creative sketches uh, with uh, uh, code. Um, uh, Kesey was uh, um, uh, turning 50 yesterday uh, night, and this, uh, uh, in, on this occasion, he decided to uh, make uh, a mint uh, and uh, a live minting uh, uh, party. Uh, party. Uh, what's happening in this uh, call? Basically, uh, he, he did this project, which is called Century. <coughs> Century is, uh, uh, you can see an image uh, uh, here. This is uh, uh, my Century token, actually. Uh, Century is uh, a, a generative uh, uh, code that reflects upon the uh, abstract uh, aesthetics uh, of the 20th century that uh, uh, were uh, influencing for Kesiria's uh, 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 himself. Uh, and it's also uh, a speculation about uh, uh, time and uh, uh, duration. And uh, uh, yesterday night he made a new uh, edition of uh, uh, Century, which is called the Century 2052, uh, because, uh, uh, of course, he's 50, he's wondering if uh, he will uh, uh, mm, uh, see or not uh, 2052. Uh, and so he generated some kind of uh, uh, clock uh, work that uh, will will uh, expire in the wallet of the buyers uh, uh, when uh, uh, it will turn uh, 80, uh, if uh, uh, it survives that, uh, uh, that, uh, that age. So this project, project was very personal, very intimate. It decided not to uh, properly sell uh, it, but to donate uh, it uh, uh, to a number of uh, uh, people that were invited to do the live meeting with, uh, with him, so to have some uh, uh, chat, some discussion, and uh, to have a small uh, party uh, together. Why I'm talking about, uh, uh, about this? Uh, because um, um, uh, there are uh, many uh, downsides uh, in the um, uh, web-free uh, economy and the, in the uh, NFT model. I completely agree with most uh, uh, of the things Andrea said so, uh, so far, and uh, in my book uh, I also go uh, even more critical on some uh, uh, topics uh, concerning the uh, creation of uh, uh, abstract uh, uh, unicity in the digital uh, uh, environment uh, about uh, uh, copyright related copyright topics related to um, um, to NFTs and things like uh, like that. But at the same time, uh, uh, what uh, I've been uh, seeing along this uh, uh, couple of uh, uh, years and what I keep uh, seeing uh, uh, today uh, is also uh, a pleasure, uh, a pleasure of uh, uh, community life and uh, exchange. I mean, what uh, uh, we have seen here is uh, a free economy that uh, uh, employs uh, um, the uh, uh, infrastructure of the uh, blockchain uh, in order to uh, donate, not to uh, sell. Everybody in this group can also now uh, sell their own uh, NFT, of course, and uh, uh, generate uh, an increasing uh, uh, market that may benefit Kesiris, uh, uh, but probably it won't be the case for most of the people that keep this, uh, this token, because having it uh, also means uh, um, 
uh, in a way being uh, uh, attached to the uh, artist and to the, uh, his own life. And the, the piece itself, uh, uh, however, relying uh, on uh, uh, the infrastructure of uh, uh, the blockchain also raises question about it. Will uh, the very infrastructure that makes uh, the life and death uh, uh, of this uh, uh, token uh, possible uh, uh, outlive uh, uh, Kesiris, uh, or it will last just uh, two, three uh, years? So when I speak about infrastructure, I speak about uh, the uh, blockchain, but I speak also about the platform where we made the uh, minting, uh, which is called uh, uh, Artblocks. Um, here I just uh, uh, contextualized this uh, uh, animation uh, that was generated yesterday night for me. It's a token number 12 uh, of the project. Uh, within my small uh, uh, collection of uh, NFTs, I, I've never been uh, a collector. I've always been uh, uh, an avid uh, downloader of uh, uh, things that uh, uh, are av available for free uh, online. I keep uh, downloading uh, uh, things that are available online because it's a part uh, uh, of the economy of the, of the web. Um, uh, but uh, I also started uh, uh, using uh, about, um, some little money that uh, uh, I have uh, in order sometimes uh, to uh, buy uh, digital artworks and support the artists behind, uh, uh, behind them. I'm buying uh, to keep these tokens, not to, to sell them. I'm not really interested in their economic value. Most uh, of them are under, the, uh, are under uh, 100 uh, uh, euros of uh, value, and probably maybe uh, some of them uh, uh, even uh, less, like five uh, for uh, uh, euros. Um, but uh, 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 I, I'm saying this because, uh, um, of course, uh, uh, the uh, economy of uh, Web3 has been, uh, along the last two years, uh, shaped mainly by uh, speculators. And uh, um, that uh, uh, was the driving force, uh, what made uh, uh, many, some people rich, uh, many uh, other people uh, uh, probably poorer. Um, uh, but what... Uh, uh, still uh, strong in, uh, in this, I think it's uh, uh, the uh, possibility to join the game and to join it uh, uh, critically. And so I'm shortly coming to uh, Silvia's uh, uh, question. My uh, exhibition was called uh, um, the Byzantine general, General's Problem because uh, uh, it made a reference to a um, uh, problem of uh, uh, consensus uh, that uh, belongs uh, to um, uh, gaming uh, theory and that, uh, so, uh, um, uh, how can I say, the solution to this problem is actually what uh, uh, made uh, the uh, blockchain so strong from a um, technological point uh, of, uh, of view. In this uh, uh, problem, in this narrative, in the short uh, example, uh, different uh, generals are diseasing uh, Byzantium, uh, and uh, they, they don't have uh, uh, a general on top of them, so they have uh, to uh, find a solution, agree on a solution, without uh, uh, having the possibility to rely on a, a, a communication protocol between, uh, uh, between uh, uh, them. Um, and of course, uh, uh, solving this problem means uh, um, uh, finding a way to uh, agree and to fight against the traitor, the general that may take a, a different uh, uh, decision. And I think that the traitor is a very powerful metaphor uh, for the role that uh, uh, people and artists uh, should uh, uh, take within the environment uh, uh, of the blockchain. Again, uh, this uh, uh, technology has been around for uh, um, 
uh, a couple of decades now, since 2008 to 2009 with the Bitcoin uh, uh, blockchain. Uh, it's uh, strong. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it has been uh, uh, designed quite, uh, quite well, but it's still something that can be affected and shaped by uh, programmers, by hackers. Um, all the uh, different perspectives that uh, um, um, Silvia uh, mentioned uh, in her question no, from my uh, text uh, are actually uh, true. There are people that believe uh, in uh, uh, the blockchain uh, as uh, uh, the ultimate dream for capitalism, and there are others that uh, uh, consider it an instrument to destroy capitalism. And both uh, this group of people are uh, shaping uh, uh, the, 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 the blockchain and the dynamics around the uh, the blockchain. And what I think uh, uh, is that uh, we have uh, uh, um, to uh, contribute uh, not just with the coding, with programming, but also with the uh, uh, discourse, uh, with the artworks and so on, in enforcing uh, uh, what uh, uh, can uh, uh, allow uh, to uh, develop uh, uh, what's strong in this uh, uh, technology. No? For example, its power uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, powerfulness uh, in terms of uh, uh, community uh, generation and uh, uh, governance and things like, uh, like that. So here I, I just have uh, uh, a few examples of uh, artworks. Uh, some of them were featured in the exhibition, uh, some of them not, uh, that uh, uh, raised some critical points uh, uh, around the uh, blockchain. This is about uh, the promise uh, of uh, enrichment for uh, everybody. You put a token with an extraordinary price uh, in the hope that at some point somebody will believe in you and uh, pay uh, uh, 999 it, uh, to support your uh, work and change your life. The dream of uh, uh, mm, life-changing uh, uh, money has been uh, uh, the fuel uh, around uh, uh, these two years of crypto summer. Um, this work uh, is very interesting because um, it tries uh, to draw a parallel between uh, the uh, new economy of uh, the uh, late 90s uh, and the uh, economy around uh, uh, blockchain. And all these uh, uh, websites and the logos that are featured uh, in this work by Simon Denny and collaborators uh, are uh, names uh, and logos of companies uh, that uh, promised this, mm, uh, and uh, offered uh, uh, technological logical solutions in the uh, late 90s and that failed uh, uh, miserably. Some of the idea behind uh, uh, them were sometimes uh, uh, developed by other companies later on. Some of them are still uh, uh, there uh, waiting to be uh, developed. So mm, by uh, resurrecting these uh, uh, companies, the idea is uh, to raise a parallel between uh, uh, these uh, uh, companies uh, uh, coming out uh, uh, today promising uh, uh, eternity for your uh, uh, files, uh, promising uh, uh, accessibility, promising uh, uh, wealth for uh, creative artists and so on, that may fail the day uh, after, like uh, some uh, of them already, already did. Uh, this one was a criticism about uh, the idea of decentralization. Uh, to say it in short, uh, the um, blockchain is uh, actually uh, decentralized, but sometimes uh, uh, this uh, decentralization doesn't scale up and doesn't uh, transfer to the companies which are built upon the uh, blockchain. So the, the work was basically demonstrating that uh, while uh, uh, the token uh, is actually uh, something uh, uh, which is not uh, uh, alterable by uh, people, the link between uh, uh, the token, the code on the blockchain and the artwork is something that can be uh, very uh, easily uh, manipulated and, uh, and changed. Uh, and so I think it's at the end of my time, but uh, uh, yeah, the idea be be behind all these, uh, these works uh, was uh, uh, not uh, rejecting uh, the blockchain, but uh, trying to join uh, the game and join, joining it with uh, uh, awareness and wish to uh, contribute, if possible, to uh, its development, or better, to the ideas of the people shaping uh, it.
So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Domenico. You raised a very important issue, uh, which is uh, creators uh, right now in Web 2.0 are actually in an economy which is not at all concerning the uh, remuneration of their work. So you're saying, uh, I'm using NFT to support other artists. This is also uh, similar to what Maria is, uh, um, is trying to do at the moment. Also, um, Andrea was saying something interesting when he was saying that um, the NFT craze produced a lot of content. And um, this is also something concerning Maria's work because uh, as I uh, read in one of the tweets you repost, uh, NFTs are a clusterfuck. We need someone who curates this. So I'm gonna pass the mic to you. Cool. First of all, thank you so much for uh, you know the time you took to uh, prepare this great panel. I'm very lucky to be talking inside of an artwork. I think that's really, really special. I've done a more formal presentation because I didn't expect to be like, presenting inside of an artwork, so I'm just gonna be fast. <laughs> so, yeah, basically, my name is Maria Paula. I, uh, I come from Argentina, but I've been living in Berlin, which is, you know, one of the epicenters for the experimentation between blockchain and art. And, uh, you know, I do a bunch of different things, uh, but uh, my main two things is I, I founded the Department of Decentralization in 2018 uh, to explore the intersection between hacker culture and, you know, the Berlin culture and the arts. And we've done hackathons, but also I've done, uh, I've written a few papers as well. And the second paper that, uh, that we published was, pub uh, was, was published at the start of 2021. And we saw something moving and something that was odd. Uh, because I've been in NFT since 2018, since you know, everyone was really weird, as uh, Andrea said. And you know, we all thought they were demented. You know, I was interested because I'm interested in provenance as well. But I felt something bubbling, you know, like when, when water is about to boil. Um, and it was really interesting because at the time we published the paper, um, the NFT boom exploded and nothing could have ever prepared us uh, to, to experience what we experienced in 2021, Acceler like some acceleration of a, a what blockchain going mainstream by the use case that we would have never expected. As well, uh, the truth is that Web3 is much larger than NFTs. It's much larger than a metaverse. It's about decentralized infrastructure that's able to protect your data, that's able to give you back control of your finances, that's able to give you alternative systems of governance. And there's also, of course, cryptocurrencies. Uh, you know, I'm interested Personally, my, my gateway was actually, you know, coming from Argentina, I, I'm very interested on alternative systems. And one of them is a financial system because, you know, we don't own uh, the power for it towards our finances. So, yeah, blockchain is actually like the quote that I pulled says, um, incredible. It has so many different applications and currency is really the last interesting thing that you can do with this technology. This quote that I pulled is from uh, the Ryzen presentation by Kevin McCoy, who is an artist, and Anil Dash, who is a technologist in the 7 on 7 on Ryzen, which is a program that matches technologies with artists, and then they experiment together. And the first NFT, proto one of the first NFT prototypes, actually, uh, was born in one of these uh, meetups. Um, so this, this is actually from them. Um, so... Currently, um, uh, I've been doing uh, I've been uh, yeah uh, doing JPEG. JPEG is a curation protocol. Um, I'm gonna explain it a little bit later because uh, I think that it's really interesting the way that we're building and it matches as well the, the things that you guys are building. Um, uh, so yeah, I started a company with some people from the internet that's called JPEG uh, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, this is uh, the badge of the Department of Decentralization. Um, the two papers that I've mentioned before, maybe I should have moved through the slides a, a little bit faster, but you know, <laughs> I forgot I made them. Um, and yeah, 
you know, I, I also uh, do some art projects. I actually, um, Domenico, I'm part of Dotcom Seance. I run the Twitter account. <laughs> I'm the secret moderator of the Twitter account. So really interesting, and thank you so much for bringing up our project. And this is a project that I, uh, that I did with my uh, nonprofit, Department of Decentralization, and Hito Steil. Um, we took over the ENS, which is the Ethereum domain of the Bundeskunsthalle in Germany. Bundeskunsthalle means like the National Art Hall. And uh, we decided that the Bundeskunsthalle belonged to us. Um, and then we had people present different alternatives for governance of the Bundeskunsthalle. You know, everything was a performance. We didn't squat anything. Uh, you know, the Bundeskunsthalle is fine, and it has always been fine. And yeah, we, we basically created a quadratic voting app, which is a type of voting that runs a, can run on the blockchain or not, but it's very popular in blockchain science, in blockchain circles. And we had people vote for the three different um, governance proposals. One, I presented it and was based on the assumption that since the Bundeskunsthalle is from the, you know, is uh, funded by taxpayers, then all the taxpayers are actually stakeholders and should take um, and should be able to make decisions of the art that's included in the in the program of the Kunsthalle. And then there was another one that was tracking ENS staff domains as a way of having an inventory that could compete with other institutional inventories. And then, of course, the Bundeskunsthalle, which is there, the poor um, president, I think, of the Bundeskunsthalle had, uh, had to actually defend his uh, own model of how the organization works. Turns out, I won. Um, it was great. Um, at least I win on the internet. Um, <laughs> and uh, the whole, uh, you know, and the whole like sort of closing was that the quadratic voting results um, shuffled a video by Hito Steil, who sort of skimmed the whole thing, and the video got collected again by the Bundeskunsthalle because the first video was already collected by them. So it was a really nice um, example of a building in dialogue with technologists and you know, non-profit organizations like mine and uh, with you know, Hito, which is, she is an artist and in an incredible philosopher as well, and an institution. And building in dialogue speaks a lot of uh, how I want to build infrastructure on Web3 and how I think everyone should be building as well, um, even if that doesn't happen to be the case a lot of the times. Um, so I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna maybe pass this. Basically, um, at JPEG, which is my company, we are a, very concerned about the overflow of uh, NFTs. Uh, and it's the same as the overflow of information on the internet. It's the same as the problem uh, with curation in Wikipedia. And you know, everything circles around people having very disbalanced motives and uh, the wrong people coming into power. It also happens you know, with regards to you, metaverses, you know, who owns the tools, uh, who owns the technological capacity to build metaverses. All of that is very concentrated. And also, you know, as Andrea well said, you know, it's, it's also about the collectors and, you know, who owns the rarities. Um, the problem of accumulation in you know, virtual, uh, virtual circles is very present whether uh, towards information alpha, uh, as we like to call it, which is, you know, the, yeah, the, in the capacity to invest on really good promises, or, uh, you know, the tools. Um, uh, and yeah, sadly, very few people have this. Um, we want to democratize it, or at least we want to try our best to democratize it. We want to uh, build neutral infrastructure that's able to be used by everyone, that uh, one should not have to own a very expensive NFT to be able to access or to be able to become a thought leader in the space and share their knowledge. Uh, because information wants to be free, uh, not used as alpha. Um, so we're trying to build with all of that in mind in dialogue with many stakeholders and, you know, by stakeholders, as before I said, the taxpayers are the stakeholders of a, a whole of arts of a government. I think that the stakeholders of the metaverse are every internet user that wants to join the metaverse. You know, it shouldn't be with, with barriers. Um, 
So yeah, what is JPEG? Um, we build infrastructure for Web3 cultural objects. In short, uh, cultural objects are, uh, for now, NFTs. Um, I don't think that uh, right now the NFT space, it's very, uh, it's just very populated. It has zero curation. The little efforts that are made towards uh, curation are sometimes drowned also by the Twitter noise, which is, uh, Get, and the foreign noise, which is getting really insane, or the back holders uh, that control a lot of the very expensive assets that then assume positions of power. Um, we think that Web3 cultural infrastructure is the way to achieve the gravitas that NFTs as cultural objects of a, our world uh, need. And with this in mind, um, of course, if we're building Web3 infrastructure, then it should be permissionless, it should be decentralized, and it should be open. The data should be open and viewable to all. Um, first iteration of a platform launched in July 2021. It was closed, of course, uh, but you know we had to test. Uh, we're building something that no one has ever built before. Um, so it's a really hard challenge as well um, because you know we don't know if people are gonna want it. You know we don't know if people are gonna are just in NFTs to invest because they're insane, or you know they're just be really believers in culture. We really don't know this. Uh, a year later, I still don't know this. If you have the answer, get in touch with me. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so the. But yeah, so here's a, a little bit of our approach um, in hopes that it also will, uh, you know, spark the conversation around uh, the, uh, the collaborative, uh, meta can I say metaverse? Is that a world? Yeah. World? Anti-metaverse? Anti yeah. Uh, the collaborative anti-metaverse that you guys are building. So we build many different things, many different experiences. Um, I am a Web3 native. I've been in crypto for a long time, but I've never touched the metaverse. Um, I, I live in the real world. I like these kind of experiences more than I like digital art. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I think that actually the correct way to enter any kind of circle is through um, education and, you know, having, a, you know, part, uh, active participants. Um, so JPEG uh, builds an exhibition interface that anyone can use uh, with a wallet without any token and just uh, build their own NFT exhibitions, then community source governed and curated list of NFTs uh, that are able to stratify and order the space that are crowdsourced as well. And then we have experiments, uh, we curate exhibitions, uh, we do sales, uh, we do little conceptual projects, and yeah, everything is in dialogue. So, yeah. Thank you, I don't know where the other mics are, but. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for, for this intervention. And uh, now uh, I think it's the time to pass uh, the mic to uh, Ryder, who's waiting there <laughs> since like one hour. And um, so uh, Ryder in the last year was involved in a very interesting project with Provoke actually a lawsuit and uh, counter lawsuits, but it was very important because uh, it was a project of conceptual art who has um, an aftermath in reality. So many celebrities actually stopped, used uh, BAYC, and he's gonna tell us better. <laughs> uh, so uh, when you want, Ryder, you, you can start. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Uh, it's been a great talk so far. Let me just share my screen. Do, 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 do. Okay, cool. So um, I've been thinking a lot uh, recently actually about this uh, WeWork, uh, this kind of like scam that was going on with WeWork. I don't know if you guys know, it's this giant kind of inflated business called WeWork that uh, was started by this guy, Adam Newman. And um, I was thinking about just like how there are kind of parallels with the uh, NFT industry right now in terms of just how inflated it is and what the promise might be or what it might not be. And I've also been thinking about how uh, the nature of culture and uh, people's interest in, in certain topics is, is sort of cyclical and how uh, Adam started WeWork with uh, the idea of, of, of kind of being a, uh, a, a kibbutz, an Israeli kibbutz, which is kind of a, 
an older idea and, and applying that to, to newer technology. Thinking about how um, we start at a point of, of kind of primitive origins trying to go back and we wander around and then we kind of either arrive back at the at the primitive origin or at some sort of uh, weird version of it, which I think is accurate to to the state of NFT. Um, in my own in my own work, I I try to create provocations that will illuminate truths, um, especially in my work about blockchain. Um, so so like um, I think it's important to understand where blockchain came from, as it's been illuminated earlier uh, by. Um, previous speakers, the uh, the NFT was conceived of by Anil Dash and Kevin McCoy for a Rhizome 7 on 7 conference. Uh, I was actually in the audience of this conference. And um, it's it's so interesting to, to see this particular slide because it, it really just lays out the purpose of NFT in one in one single slide that I think has not been uh, developed any 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 further from from its origin. Of when NFT was invented in uh, 2014 by these two guys, and and the the purpose is uh, verification, uh, showing that there is a unique uh, item that you can verify uh, its origin, and uh, in doing so, you're 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 establishing provenance, which is a chain of ownership, um, and in doing so, uh, th there's sort of a, a a theoretical and philosophical reason which uh, is outlined in, in the last bullet here, which is uh, that it supports and empowers artists without uh, artificially constraining access, which is a tenant of uh, Bitcoin in itself. Uh, and a tenant of blockchain is, is this kind of idea of universal access and uh, making the, the data egalitarian. Um, uh, a project that I recently came across that I didn't know about, but, but it's one of the earliest NFTs that relates to my own work uh, was by uh, Nilly uh, Lerner, and it was called um, Nilly Coin. And what she did was um, she created a, uh, this was actually on the, the Bitcoin blockchain uh, using a, a, a system called Counterparty where, where uh, you, could, you could create, you know, kind of altcoins and tokens on, uh, on top of Bitcoin. Anyway, so she created this, Nilly coin, which uh, was, you know, Coca-Cola coin, and she made Apple coin and eBay coin. And the idea was, um, you know, to, to create a provocation on uh, intellectual property and, uh, you know, the nature of uh, how blockchain is a self-regulating system uh, that, that is sort of outside of corporate uh, power and, and, and control. Uh, and, and it was a provocation on that. Um, and, and I think it's interesting that, that, that this project was just a few months after the advent of NFT, um, meaning the, the, the conceptual basis of this project is, is I think, uh, extremely relevant still today. And, uh, and I don't think we've, we've uh, moved and, and kind of established uh, the, the complicated problems that Nillycoin ha has kind of put out there. Um, and so uh, where the blockchain kind of went after, after the, this, this very uh, infant uh, moment in 2014, where people was, were still really experimenting, was this place of uh, radical commercialization. Um, and I would call it just, just blatant bullshit. There, there were scams on top of scams of, uh, of coins, of tokens on the Ethereum blockchain, particularly that promised ridiculous things like, for instance, uh, this one was a token that would revolutionize air travel. Um, <clears throat> obviously, that did not work out, <clears throat> although the token garnered billions of dollars. Um, this is another token that was promising uh, a, a solution for traceability uh, in, in, in food products via the blockchain. Why you need a token to do that, I'm not sure. Um, you know, oftentimes these companies would have white papers that that now, if you read them, they almost seem like conceptual art or something. Um, they're they're just completely full of fluff and uh, posturing, and they seem like they're written on Adderall or something like that. Um, so so the next uh, step was was bringing this kind of tokenization of bullshit into NFT, uh, which you could see with projects like Axie Infinity, which was sort of a tokenized 
game and an early example of uh, an NFT on the Ethereum blockchain that uh, did pretty well commercially. <clears throat> Um, but it wasn't until this project where the real commercial viability and interest in NFT started, which is uh, CryptoPunks. You can't really tell, but this is actually an image sprite of all of the CryptoPunks. Uh, in fact, it's just one image. Um, all of the CryptoPunks are, are really one image. So when you buy a token, you're just buying the placement of uh, positioning of this image, which is, which is a further interesting way to think about uh, the implications of, of what an NFT is, because it's certainly not the image. It perhaps is the placement of the image or the placement within the blockchain. Um, <clears throat> CryptoPunks is an interesting project because since the beginning of it, the founders of it had lied and said that they were the first NFT, which was uh, pretty ridiculous to anyone who, like myself, was in the audience uh, at, at Rhizome 7 on 7 and witnessed uh, the first NFT being created. Um, or people, you know, who otherwise just understood that there was much more history to uh, digital art, uh, especially digital art on the internet, and particularly digital art on blockchain. Uh, here is a tweet from 2020, where you can see uh, crypto punks going for like $50. And um, the, the poster of the tweet said that it's the first NFT on Ethereum, <laughs> which is funny. Um, this is a way back machine reference to CryptoPunks <clears throat> uh, on their uh, on the open sea. And uh, you can see there they they state themselves that it's the first NFT, which is a lie. Um, if you if you really do some research and you dig, you'll find that cryptopunks um, for for a long time, like such as that screenshot in 2020 where they were going for fifty dollars, uh, th they were they were basically not not doing extremely well. I mean, and 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 sort of by the standards that we uh, understand as extremely well today, meaning they were selling for fifty dollars and not uh, fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars. And um, from my research, the catalyst that brought them into the scope of uh, of a major asset class was Gary V. Um, buying about 50 of them and then doing a phone call with uh, business leaders and influencers within tech. Um, it's actually interesting. There's a video I found recently where Mr. Beast is is describing this phone call. And uh, it, it's it's quite a it's quite a fascinating piece of history because all this stuff is online and accessible, so you could you could easily trace the root of it. So um, when Gary V started started promoting these things, um, it, it it brought attention to to the NFT market uh, in a way that had not been seen before, and and it's interesting to think about you know Gary V as a person uh, you know he he's he's a more of a business leader and uh, you know before doing this he he did a lot of um, uh, videos on you know kind of motivating you and 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 teaching you uh, how to make money uh and, and very much his his frame is business and not art so i think uh it's extremely important to understand the entirety of uh the market froth of uh of nft in, in this light because it it really set the stage for the next uh two years <clears throat> uh i have this picture just because i thought it was funny that um like the i think that there there's some parallel between the um vape economy and the idea of vaporware and and just vapor in general, and like the idea of um, of technologies sort of uh, creating vapor <laughs> and and kind of the proliferation of vaping in in, in conjunction to uh, NFT. I think there's some parallel there, <laughs> and and I think it's important to think about uh, you know all of this as vapor. <clears throat> Um, and so, so in, in, in this whole process, I was hypercritical of, of everything, every element of this, I, I, cause, cause I just was, I, I knew that, uh, crypto punks were not the first NFT. Um, and, and I thought, you know, this whole kind of like mad dash, uh, from, from the business side of things and from a, a group of people who really had no previous interest or understanding of the rich history of digital art. Uh, it, it seemed it seemed very strange and forced and 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 pretty obvious that it was that it was just market driven and money driven, and so I decided to to create provocations 
around this. Um, and one of the first provocations I did was I, I took this uh, CryptoPunk 3100, which um, at the time I think sold for $7 million. And then the buyer of it uh, was trying to sell it, turn around it, uh, a sale for $91 million. So I took the same uh, CryptoPunk image and I just minted it myself, which you know I, I didn't think would be that big of a deal, but um, it actually kind of created a lot of buzz and, and a lot of people were sort of un, not even understanding how I could do that. Like, like they, their understanding of NFT was so rudimentary that they did not understand that you could even remint an image, that you could just take some image that exists and put it uh, back online. And, um, you know, you, you see a lot of memes uh, talking about right click save. And I think if your understanding of, uh, of the internet is, is that simple as right click save, um, you know, it's going to be difficult for, for you. So yeah, like this is a text message from Farouk, who is a uh, influencer in NFT who I showed the piece to. And he actually sent a link to the uh, the person who ended up buying it, uh, whose name is Jason Williams, who is a is a pretty prominent Bitcoin influencer and 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 thinker. But um, you can see here in this text message that he was kind of questioning what it was. He says, "Yo, you're selling a one to one replica," um, and I said, "No, if I was selling that, I I would have forty two hundred ETH, which is what the original sold for. Obviously, the token and the purpose of the token." um are are distinct and, and the token has no purpose if it's divorced from the idea of who who made it when did they make it why did they make it um and so i explained the piece to him here uh let me just try to do, do, do i can just summarize this uh the prunk i'll just read the end of this the punk promise of of Cryptocurrency to be free from nation state with privacy standards seems to be idealistic in an age of highly regulated monopolized exchanges and NFT and NFTs where quote provenance is established through connecting a wallet to a person. My resale of CryptoPunk 3100 is a newer, more human uh, and has more meaning than the original punk. <laughs> Larva Labs thing. So the idea of this project was was to create a punk that was more punk than the original, um, and 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 this and this really created like uh, a lot of discussion within the NFT community, um, and uh, discussion on how Larva Labs should deal with this. And this was a public issue on Twitter. And and how they ended up dealing with it was sending me a DMCA takedown notice. Um, at which point uh, <laughs> I minted that, of course, and and that became part of the piece. But I also, um, oh, this is the letter that they sent me. Um, and, I, and I saw this to be extremely antithetical to, to the self-governance idea and ideal of uh, cryptocurrency in the blockchain. Uh, I, thought, I thought it was ridiculous that, that they were sending me a DMCA alleging that I had copied their, their NFT when, in fact, it's impossible to copy an NFT. And that's the entire point of NFT is that it's a token on a blockchain that cannot be changed. It can't be copied. It is fixed with the wallet that minted it attached to it and the data was minted. And so by definition, it is not the same NFT. Um, anyway, so they had sent me this DMCA to which I had replied and sent a counter uh, argument stating that this was within the parameters of fair use. Um, and the way the DMCA process works is they have 14 days to respond to, to my counter with a uh, with a with a lawsuit, and so I basically challenged them to do that, uh, which they didn't do, um, uh, and so the piece was put back up onto the platform onto the platform foundation. Of course, ironically, you know you cannot delete it from the blockchain. You could only take it off from certain platforms, and a very uh, th this is this is a this is an extremely uh, centralized <clears throat> approach to blockchain in general, where uh, you DMCA or uh, censor content on one platform, uh, where whereas the entire entirety of the blockchain is uh, disseminated on many bla uh, platforms, um, and it is on, on a public ledger that cannot be changed. So you cannot DMCA a public ledger 
Um, and, and, and that's part of that. The idea of the work in and of itself is that uh, no matter what goes on it, it, it it's, it's fixed in a, in a permanent state uh, that is impenetrable from governments. Um, anyways, so uh, yeah, so, so they didn't do anything and they didn't, they didn't sue me or anything. So I put, so, so the work got put back on to foundation and, and I put that um, uh, as a new NFT, of course. And so th this idea of documenting history within NFT and using NFT as art, I think is another aspect of my work that uh, I enjoy. <clears throat> another piece that I did shortly after this was uh, this sort of take on uh, the Magritte, this is not a pipe, this, uh, this is not a punk, <laughs> with a punk smoking uh, the pipe. So, uh, you know, the idea of this is, is um, you know, the, the, the piece itself uh, you know, obviously the Magritte work is called the treachery of images and, and my work was called the treachery of NFTs. And I think what the treachery of NFTs is, is basically uh, people's inability or, or the problems that, that, uh, that, that are faced when um, you tie too much to the image and not the token. And I think, um, I think that's similar to, to the, what the treachery of images is in, in Magritte's case is, is when you tie too much emphasis onto uh, the, 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 the image itself and you don't look into the symbolism of that image. And similarly with uh, my critique of NFT is when you don't look into the symbolism of the token. And so I think uh, the token itself is of great importance. Um, and, and I'll cover that a bit later. <clears throat> uh, this guy, uh, Kenny Schachter, uh, DM me and told me that my work wasn't uh, unique. <laughs> and then someone, um, he, he showed me this other project um, where, where someone actually kind of used, uh, used my ideas and, and, and was, I guess, inspired by, by this uh, reappropriation. And they did their own version, uh, which was called CryptoPunks. And so on the left is a CryptoPunk. And then the creators of this thing called CryptoPunks basically just mirrored the image. And, uh, and and re-uploaded them onto the blockchain. Um, and they created this manifesto that was very much in, in sort of the same ideals and uh, sharing the same ideas as, uh, as, as I had put forth on the 3100 Mint. Um, and so, so yeah, the, the, but the, theirs was an entire clone of the crypto punk collection, uh, all 10,000 images were put back onto Ethereum blockchain uh, and people could mint them. I actually had minted a couple of them right in the beginning, um, but I was I was kind of uh, upset with the project, uh, a little bit as salty, uh, just because I thought that they were kind of taking a little bit of my swag, <laughs> but I, I got over that. Um, uh, they, they actually received a DMCA request in the same uh, fashion that I had. And, and I had actually helped them uh, craft a letter, but because this team who created the project were anonymous, um, part of the thing with a DMCA request is you have to include your name and address. And so because they're an anonymous team, they didn't do that. And, and the, the project kind of went dormant and uh, it was banned from OpenSea. And uh, when, when you're banned from the largest marketplace in NFT, which is OpenSea, they make up like 95% of all volume. Uh, it's very hard to do anything. Um, and then I met this guy who goes by Pauly OX on, on uh, Twitter. And, and he, um, he was like, hey, man, do you want to meet up? He was in LA as well. And I said, sure. And we met up. <clears throat> he was um, telling me how he's so He actually was buying a bunch of my work as well. And he was just telling me about how passionate he is about these, what he called shit punks. Um, basically derivative of, uh, of crypto punks or what I would call more punk versions of crypto punks. And he was just telling me about how um, devoted the entire uh, crypto funk community is. Uh, and, and it was really getting me amped up. It was like all these people were engaging with this conceptual art piece that uh, I thought was really great for the, the blockchain ecosystem in the sense that it was provocative and it was challenging um, a corporate interest and it was uh, existing within the ideals of the blockchain. It truly decentralized. Um, and so together that, that day, um, we actually conceived of this idea. I thought of this uh, concept of creating a new 
uh, a marketplace, or, or I think maybe he was going to do that anyways. But I said, why don't you just copy Larva Labs uh, marketplace exactly and call it not Larva Labs? And so um, I didn't think anything of it. And two months later, he uh, he actually took that idea and built it. <laughs> and I, I never would have believed. Uh, he, he he worked with two other uh, with, with two other people two developers and uh, they, they launched this this marketplace, not Larva Labs. And um, I definitely never would have thought that that uh, this would have this would have actually happened and materialized. But through the launch of this marketplace, um, I got really in, involved in, in the idea of NFTs being a vehicle for community creation and being a vehicle to uh, join people together through their ideas and their um, their passions and their beliefs and the way that they want to envision and see the world. And this project very much was uh, imbued with a philosophy um, that I think was a lot different, or it still, it still exists and it's still popular. So it is a lot different than sort of the corporate um, commercial NFT projects that uh, are still pervasive to this day. But, um, this project was uh, was 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 something different, and 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 I and I got super into it. Um, at, at its height, <clears throat> uh, the NFTs, the crypto funks, were selling for ridiculous amounts of money. Here's one that sold for almost half a million dollars, <laughs> um, and and they were they were doing really well um, until. <laughs> I think uh, myself and, and other members uh, of the community, including Jeremy, um, who is Paul AXO, started critiquing the Board Ape Yacht Club. Uh, on December 7th, a friend of mine uh, sent me this text message uh, showing a comparison between the Board Ape Yacht Club logo and the Nazi SS Totenkampf logo. And from there, uh, I just went down this rabbit hole. I put this tweet up that said, hey, Board Ape Yacht Club, do you own the IP for the Nazi logo you copied? The reason I provoked them in terms of this IP question was because uh, a big selling point for their NFT was that you own the IP, which is uh, something that I've I've been continually challenging, and uh, it, it's it's a big aspect of my work is is questioning what is IP ownership uh, within NFT. Um, anyway, so that tweet got a lot of attention, <clears throat> and I started looking into the Board Ape Yacht Club more. Uh, and I found out that the four people who, uh, who who created it, their handles online were all very strange. One of them was uh, named Gargamel, is named Gargamel, which is like an anti-Semitic depiction of a Jewish person. Another person's uh, handle was Gordon Goner, which is an anagram for Drongo Negro. One of them's name is Emperor Tomato Ketchup, which is a... Uh, avant-garde Japanese film that is banned in some countries and for being child pornography and it has the KKK in it and has fascism and uh, all sorts of really crazy lewd shit. Another person's name is SAS and the SAS is the two uh, you know divisions of the Nazi military. Um, and you know then I started analyzing the um, the images themselves. I noticed like they have this Prussian helmet in in the collection which is pretty strange. Uh, and in addition, they have this uh, sushi chef headband, uh, which actually they call it a sushi chef headband, but it actually says kamikaze in kanji. So it's sort of this this inside joke. And um, if you've been around the internet and 4chan culture, you know, uh, this kind of type of uh, dog whistling or, uh, you know, kind of hiding in plain sight, nudge, nudge, uh, making fun of people is is pretty commonplace, and so I I started uh, really just just going all in on on researching this NFT and and trying to expose it. Um, the NFT itself is made by a company called Yuga Labs. Uh, this this idea of the Kali Yuga is is a very prevalent uh, concept amongst um, people on 4chan and Poll specifically, and it's also been gaining a lot of headway. Um, geopolitically with people like Alex Dugan, uh, Steve Bannon, uh, uh, Richard Spencer, uh, neo-Nazis in America, but also um, people uh, in Europe uh, amongst this uh, kind of traditionalist school, Rene Guénon, Julius Evola, people like that. 
Um, I, I put up a website uh, that compiled this research along with uh, a bunch of other people's research on gordongoner.com, which is the pseudonym of one of the founders. And I chose that because uh, it would be easier to find if people were to search for that guy's name. Um, so I compiled all the stuff, I put it up. This was like in January. Um, <clears throat> sometime after that, uh, the Board Ape Yacht Club uh, and Yuga Labs uh, purchased actually CryptoPunks and MeBits, uh, buying the intellectual property of the then biggest NFT collection uh, and, and basically creating a monopoly. Uh, a lot of the critique uh, not only is about the uh, racist uh, problems on the, the meanings behind these images, but also uh, about it's sort of a provocation and, and putting into question the, uh, the actual purpose and uh, value of these images. <clears throat> and uh, actually 112 of these images are uh, identical. Uh, and, and these are images that they say you own the intellectual property of, meaning if you buy this monkey, you can print it on a T-shirt, you could create a beer brand, you could do whatever you want with the monkey, you own it. But how do you own it if all these monkeys are almost the same, except the background color? Uh, so, so, you know, we've been, we've been provoking that question within the community. Uh, this is a funny meme that someone named Mike3 made. Um, uh in the it's kind of making fun of that concept where you have these two monkeys in the metaverse but they have to you know hold this uh th this background to to <laughs> enforce their intellectual property um there are other people who have who have done tremendous work in in this kind of question uh such as uh alfred steiner you should definitely look up this paper uh just type in alfred steiner uh board ape yacht club nft and uh, you'll find this paper. Uh, basically, it, it 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 goes through all of the myriad of issues in terms of why uh, intellectual property, specifically copyright, is is not uh, eligible within the Board Ape Yacht Club images. Uh, this particular image uh, from the paper is 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 quite interesting. It it, it draws parallels between a famous case where a monkey took a selfie and the owner of the camera. Uh, was trying to claim copyright, and PETA, the the animal rights group, had sued him, asserting that the monkey owned the copyright. And in fact, the 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 courts ruled that the monkey did own the copyright um, because the uh, copyright can only be given with, if there is artistic human intervention uh, within a work. So thus, um, computer generated works are not eligible for copyright or works of nature. Um, this guy is, is named Jimmy ETH, uh, and he is a popular member in, in the community of Board Ape Yacht Club and CryptoPunks. <clears throat> and he had, uh, he has been, he, he basically asserted that the CryptoPunks owed Yuga Labs a bunch of money. And, and so he said, uh, in this tweet, uh, CryptoPunks are stolen art. <clears throat> Um, they just copied crypto. I mean, crypto funks are stolen art. They just copied crypto punks. Um, anyway, so so basically, he was asserting that the funks, the community that I'm a part of, uh, that I helped with the creation of the marketplace, were stolen art, <laughs> and that somehow we owed uh, money to the crypto punk community. And I said, uh, is Warhol stolen art too? And Richard Prince. Um, and, and this actually provoked me to, to do uh, an action to prove a point to this guy. And so what I did was I took his monkey image, which is this golden monkey that he owns that's, that I think at the time was worth like a million dollars or something, and I minted it myself. <laughs> and, and, and I did this to prove a point that, that you know, his monkey was not the same as my monkey, you know? And so um, because he was trying to say that Funk's owed money and were copies of punks when in fact they had an entirely new meaning uh and the 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 people who were buying funks did not buy them for the same reason as the people who were buying punks and nobody was confused which was which and that is the entire utility and purpose of of the blockchain and nft and why it's great um and so to to kind of prove this point and drive it home 
in, in a way that didn't require long essays. I just minted his golden monkey. And, and I actually did, went an extra step and I uh, made it a hexagon, um, uh, meaning on Twitter, there's an NFT function where you can kind of prove that you own something by connecting your wallet and making your icon into an NFT. Uh, he had not done that. So ostensibly my uh, monkey was like more real than his monkey. <laughs> Anyways, so so this kind of created a bunch more con uh, just commotion within the NFT community. And um, I, I asked him to sue me and uh, he said he was gonna get his uh, lawyers on me, but just caused people within my community to make fun of him. Uh, we made this uh, PFP law firm. Uh, we fight for you and your monkeys, it says. Um, and then my friend named Leander, his his uh, his brother uh, made a well worked on a big and a big uh, cryptocurrency exchange. He he made uni socks, and he said, "Oh, can I, can you mint me one of these um, one of these." R-R-B-A-Y-C's, I was calling them. I said, Ryder Rips, Board Ape Yacht Club. And he said, can you mint me one? And I said, okay, no problem. So I minted him one. He had number two token. And then I put this tweet out that said, if anyone wants a R-R-B-A-Y-C, I'll mint you one for 0.1 ETH. Send me the number. Uh, to which point, lots of people hit me up and said, please, can you mint me this one? These are all people who are uh, understanding the provocation, they were going against uh, Yuga Labs. Uh, they, they were speaking up about uh, the racist undertones in the project. They were speaking up about uh, the aspect of monopolization within the NFT community. At this point, Yuga has controlled 30% uh, of all NFT sales. <clears throat> um, anyway, so, so I just kept getting these requests and, and I kept minting them. And um, it, it got extremely popular um, <laughs> to the point where uh, you, um, Board Ape Yacht Club had actually sent a DMCA request to Foundation where I was minting these things, um, requesting it to go uh, to get taken down. And for some reason, shortly after that, they took the request back, uh, to which point the collection got, got put back up. Of course, this all became uh, part of the story and the ongoing sort of saga of the thing. <clears throat> and so um, from there, I uh, it basically got so unwieldy to mint these things by hand that um, because each one I was taking personally by request. So uh, myself and, and three others, uh, Jeremy, um, H. Wonder, and, um, and Middlemarch, Tom, uh, we created this this website called rrbayc.com, which allowed people to reserve these things. Um, I will read just uh, th this is this is sort of the the intro essay of of that website. Um, I'll I'll just skim it real real fast. I'll say um, my recent NFT work has been centered around provocations and inquiries regarding the nature of NFT provenance and digital ownership. Provenance has always been the definitive aspect in establishing an artwork's meaning and value. The technology of NFTs is widely misunderstood, but in its greatest form, it enables an immutable trace of origin and time to the publisher creator of a digital artwork. Um, and then I go, uh, RRBAYC uses satire and appropriation to protest and educate people regarding the Board Ape Yacht Club and the framework of NFTs. The work is an extension <clears throat> uh, of and in the spirit of other artists who have worked within the field of appropriation art. Um, so the other thing is, um, oh yeah, so so basically it was it was this large grid of all ten thousand images, and and you could select one of the apes and and uh, create a new mint of it uh, as 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 a form of protest and as a form of uh, of of emphasizing the purpose of NFT. Uh, you know, and so I, I basically allowed people to, to do this. And then I created this, uh, this, they had to basically, uh, approve this checkbox and, uh, the checkbox read, uh, by purchasing this Rider Rips artwork in the form of NFT, you understand this is a new mint of Board Ape Yacht Club imagery, recontextualizing it for educational purposes as protest and satirical commentary 
you cannot copy an NFT. Please see the RRBAYC contract here to verify provenance. By reserving your RRBAYC, you are purchasing a hold for an order that will be fulfilled or rejected by Rider within 24 hours, depending on the vibe of your wallet and the mood of Rider at the time, <laughs> which was pretty tongue in cheek at the end there. Um, but the idea of it was was sort of that um, you know this was a much more personalized uh, approach to NFTs in general, which which previously had had operated more or less like a lottery, at least in these 10k projects, where you would push a button and you might get uh, a gold one, or you might get a blue one, or you might get something that's garbage, um, and it, and people were were basically uh, buying this stuff more or less in the same way that they buy lottery tickets or that they put a quarter into a uh into a slot machine um and and there was no real thought about the art or the image or the meaning um so th this project actually <clears throat> within uh a few within a month or so became really really popular and um it it during Ape Fest, which is the Board Ape Yacht Club's uh, largest event, it actually did more volume than the Board Ape Yacht Club or CryptoPunks. Uh, you can't see in this screenshot, but but it did. Um, and this was, I think, um, just a huge testament to the power of conceptual art and the power of ideas. Um, it inspired. Uh, well, I mean, in conjunction with the work was uh, a YouTuber named Filion who created this documentary that further illuminated what the Board Ape Yacht Club was up to um, and the uh, insidious nature of the these images. Uh, and, you know, I think in conjunction with the RRBAYCs, it basically brought so much attention to it that uh, Yuga Labs was was forced to do something about this um, and uh, and respond, and uh, they they hit uh, myself and Jeremy uh, Kehan with a um, lawsuit that uh, was lobbed at us, and uh, we are still dealing with. Um, I will just read some highlights from their lawsuit, which I regard as frivolous, but. Um, yeah, they they see themselves as being the epitome of coolness, and they say that they will not tolerate monkey business. Um, although they hit us with a lawsuit, they have not hit, uh, for instance, BAYC Tron, which is a project that is an exact replica of the Board Ape Yacht Club on the Tron blockchain. No commentary. Uh, there's no real purpose to this thing other than commercial reasons, and they have not sued this company. So obviously, their uh, attack on myself and Jeremy is is um, purely, you know, founded in in their desire to hurt us because of our speech, and they don't like what we're saying. Um, there are countless projects like this. Here's another project called uh, Baby Ape, where you know the the board ape uh, images are also copied and as well as the um, trademarks. <clears throat> so we have responded with a what's called an anti-slap. SLAP stands for strategic lawsuit against public participation. So um, a lawsuit that's basically created from uh, the desire to silence somebody, which we believe is the entirety of Yuga Labs' lawsuit against myself and Jeremy. Um, uh, so much so that they didn't even include the logo that they're saying that um, I infringed with, which is uh, this, this, you can see this, these three logos on the bottom, the left is the board ape logo, the middle is the SS Totenkampf, and the right is my logo, which says this is based on the SS Totenkampf 18 teeth. Uh, by the way, yeah, both skulls have 18 teeth. Um, and to this day, uh, Yuga Labs won't uh, say who designed this logo. Uh, you can also see that the logos have like this scalloped edge. <clears throat> um, anyways, in, in all of this, I think it's extremely important to uh, remember the definition of NFTs. Uh, this is in Merriam-Webster, and NFTs are a unique identifier that cannot be copied, substituted, or subdivided that is recorded on a blockchain. Um, so my point is, is <clears throat> um, I think... Uh, 
what's critical is is the idea that an NFT um, is is uh, a fixed item on a blockchain that is fixed to who who minted it, when they minted it, and other contextual elements such as uh, who that person is, what the meaning of the work is, and when it was created. Um, just like how you know the contextual shift that Warhol employed in his work, um, you know, in in basically what I would I would call a in a way, uh, an old version of reminting, which is a, a term that I've coined, but um, reminting a Campbell soup image or something like that is is sort of uh, a new reflection of of something that is familiar, and it's a reflection uh, and it's a new spin because of its context and because of uh, its placement in time, uh, its placement in physical space, and its placement in authorship. Um, so, you know, the the idea I think of the power of the blockchain for me and NFT specifically is is to uh, see the power of the the token and and really respect the token as as the work itself and not the image. Um, and the token has the ability to shift context, to shift placement, and to shift authorship of a specific image. And in doing so, it can illuminate uh, and teach and uh, bring completely new meaning to, to a previously created image or um, uh, you know, something that, that basically um, has a life of its own uh, within, within this, the, these kind of uh, measures of time that the blockchain is able to uh, segment. Uh, another work that I think is, is interesting and uh, relevant to, to my work is this Duchamp, uh, miniature museum of his own work. Uh, and I think this kind of proves that the work itself um, isn't, isn't the work. The, the, the work is the idea. And um, without the idea, uh, there is nothing. And whether it's repackaged in, a, in another work in, in the form of this miniature museum, or, um, or whether it is the original, uh, the, the, the work uh, is, is something that transcends the, um, the, 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 the image or the material. <clears throat> um, another work that I'm extremely inspired by in, in this process is, uh, Robert Morris's, uh, box with the sound of its own making. And, uh, this is a fantastic work, uh, where inside of this box is a speaker that is playing the sounds of, of making the box. Um, and, and I think this process driven uh, approach to art is is really relevant, especially um, on the internet where uh, social media and um, where uh, an engaged audience, uh, an engaged community and NFT, there is definitely engaged communities um, is, is such a driving part and such a visible part of the work itself. And you cannot divorce the uh, the activities of that community or the creation of the work um, from the work itself. Uh, and, and these things are inextricably tied. And um, so, yeah, so, so I think RRBAYC is so much about the process um, and as, as, uh, as well as the nature of NFT and the provocation of uh, Board Ape Yacht Club and Yuga Labs and uh, challenging uh, the the greatest powers and the greatest corporate forces within this uh, ecosystem, uh, and in order to keep it healthy. So, that's my presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryder. This was impressive, and uh, it also shows us how uh, NFTs at the moment are a kind of legal far west and we can also contribute to write laws about it. I mean, you created a kind of precedent that uh, is kind of reshaping the, the law behind NFTs as well. Um, yeah, so this is an ongoing case as well. So, you know, keep, uh, keep an eye out for it. Follow, uh, follow me on Twitter and... Uh, you know, I, my, myself and uh, the community that I'm a part of are uh, extremely passionate about these issues. And uh, I welcome anyone to get involved uh, with this community. 
Yes, that's important because you're going to need a lot of support as well <laughs> during this uh, process. Okay, uh, so um, the, um, actually the Venice Biennale is closing. <laughs> we were, all of us were a little bit longer than expected. Um, so I think we have just five minutes before they actually close the doors. Um, maybe I'm gonna pass the word to Giacomo for a final, final question. No, uh, since we, we mentioned the, the word anti-metaverse many times, I just wanna ask you to, uh, to you, Silvia, if you can spend just a few minutes to explain to, uh, to us what you mean and since you wrote also the manifesto of superinternet.world, so please. Yeah, as all this intervention were, was showing, if you very well know the theories and the politics and the legal aspects behind NFTs and Web3, you can actually be involved in a project that can shape um, what will go on with this technology. So in our little <laughs> part, we, what we are gonna to do in the, last, in the next months is going to build this world that is actually inspired by an anti, um, let's say we are can, uh, trying to do the opposite of what is going on now uh, in the metaverses. So uh, the word is very poorly made and uh, it's called super internet of world. You're gonna see this in the future. But um, what we are trying to do is doing this in a very poorly way and try to support us artists while, while doing it, which is the opposite of what is happening on the central land. So in the central land, for example, you have, um, yeah. And maybe um, uh, highlight uh, the uh, the token instead of the, the the images as writers say, and I think the the, the idea is that this this room are a mutable mutable uh, NFT, so it's not right important the the images that people will create, but but the room uh, itself. Yes, that's true, and uh, maybe. Uh, our guest, guest speakers has some question that want to ask to one another before we close. Um, otherwise, otherwise, I think <laughs> we, we can conclude because it's uh, really very late here. But uh, thank okay, sorry about that, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, over. it's not your fault. <laughs> it's actually uh, it's a kind of a shame because we could go on for a long time. Uh, but uh, this is the time in real life, so we have to go. And uh, so I thank you everyone to be here, to join us. Uh, thank you Ryder, Ryder to join us from so far away. And uh, we hope that we could continue the conversation maybe for the next, um, another round. It would be cool. Uh, thank you. For sure. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Take care.